Now, we are in the book of Luke in our studies here. Uh, what we're doing is we come together and worship God and kind of do a little update on the ministry with ministry moments sometimes. And then we just have a little seminar, a mini seminar on the kingdom. This is a teaching. We turn this into a classroom. And um, the value of this teaching is, is completely uh, designed in how it gets applied throughout the week. If it doesn't get applied, then, then it's, it's worthless. And so what we're doing to help out with that is at the end of uh, at least most of the services, we're having uh, these uh, assignments. And those who are listening through podcasting, I think we have these available on the website, I think. Uh, but we're asking people to pick up these assignments to remind them uh, to engage in some exercises and some discussions and prayer that can help apply the teaching for that weekend throughout the week. And we're asking people to give us a testimony when something happens that is, you know, good and, and uh, they want to report on it. So here's a little testimony from last week's sermon. I needed to hear that I am called to be Jesus, even to those who are against me and persecute me. One of the points we touched, touched on last week. I've been upset by certain individuals at my job, who you could call my enemies, uh, but had an opportunity to seek forgiveness from one of them for my part in the conflict, and reconciliation may be beginning. I've been so worried about my reputation here on earth that I lost sight of Jesus' plan for my eternal life, which is to love at all times, seek reconciliation, and serve others, especially those who may not like you. Amen to that one. I will continue to seek God's will and strength in order to live this out in my probable tough times ahead at my job. Uh, maybe one of them, one of my co-workers, will see Jesus in me from now on. All glory goes to God for changing my heart. Thanks for that testimony. I appreciate it. That's the kingdom, folks. So if you find that uh, applying the exercises does something, uh, you, know, you owe it to God to brag on God and uh, give a testimony to that effect. Now we're uh, in the book of Luke, been in the book of Luke for a uh, number of years now, and we're up to chapter 17. And now we're up to verse 22 of chapter 17, and we're going to bite off 15 verses uh, this morning, which is a whole lot for us. And I've got to do it in 39 minutes, which is going to be very challenging, because this isn't the easiest bunch of, pass bunch of scriptures that, to deal with. In fact, it's quite challenging. I want to entitle this, A Sudden End and New Beginning, uh, is one of the themes that comes out here. So we're starting in verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will... Hey, stop. Look at that. I found it. I found it. I found it. <laughs> it once was lost, but now it's found. Okay, so, uh, Padrishners, I just held up my thermos, which I had lost for a couple weeks, but now it is found, and uh, hallelujah. So, the bed is back on again. Okay, now here we go. Where was I? Oh, there's a time coming, he says, when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Pause here for a moment. Uh, last week's teaching was to the Pharisees. And now he's turning and talking to his disciples. When he's talking to the Pharisees, of course, we saw last week that these are the guys who are trusting in observable things, like enforcing righteous laws to bring about the kingdom. And he's also addressing people like the Zealots who are going to trust uh, their supposed righteous violence to bring about the kingdom. And to those groups, they, what they needed to hear is, you don't bring about the kingdom that way, because the kingdom is already here. The kingdom is in your midst. And he's, reported, he's, he's referring to himself. He's there right in front of them. So that was the word, the conf confrontational word to the Pharisees. But now he turns to his disciples, and he's got a different word. He adds to the fact that he's in their midst this truth, that while the kingdom is in your midst, that's not all that is to be said about the kingdom. There's more that is coming. And what you need to know is that you need to live in a way where you're prepared for that more, the return of the Son of Man. He uses this phrase, Son of Man, which really goes back to Daniel 7, and it was a title of authority, of divine authority, and it was always associated with the end times, when the Lord would return and set things right in this creation. That's what the phrase Son of Man meant to first century Jews. And it was really surprising that he applied this to himself. I don't know any other case in history where, where a Jewish person did that. I'm the one who is going to be returning at the end of time. But then he adds this piece that no one was expecting, and that is that first the Son of Man must suffer. They thought when the Son of Man comes, it's going to be all glorious. He's going to defeat the enemies and yada, yada, yada. 
Well, Jesus is saying, yeah, that's still in the future. But first, the Son of Man must suffer many things. And he's also saying to his disciples, you're going to suffer many things. You have to expect to suffer. And that's why he says, there's coming a time where you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. You'll long for deliverance. The persecution is going to be nasty. And be careful that in that state where you're longing for deliverance, that you don't grab onto false hopes or false messiahs. People are going to come along and say, here's your hope. Here's the Messiah. Here's this or that. Don't be fooled. When the Son of Man really returns, he'll light up the sky. It's going to be obvious. Like lightning. It's going to be obvious. You don't need to guess about this. When he came the first time, okay, you, you, there it's not obvious. You have to have spiritual eyes to see the kingdom in the, the first coming of the Son of Man. But when he comes the second time, it's going to light up the whole sky. So don't go chasing after false hopes. And then Jesus goes on. He says this. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, but then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. And he goes on. On that day when the Son of Man is revealed, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down and get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. She turned into a pillar of salt. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night when the Son of Man is revealed, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? He's saying, where, where will they be taken? And Jesus replies, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Which is as clear as mud. <laughs> we'll clear that up in a little bit. Pray with me here for a moment. Because uh, this is a tough passage of scripture and it's got some very important things for us to learn from it. And some of it will be challenging, I think, to some people. Lord, uh, will you be going ahead of every word of this message to cultivate the soil of our hearts and minds to receive your word? Help us, Lord, not to prejudge your word. I think we already know it and have learned everything we need to know about it. God, help us to have a, a stance of openness to receive your word. And, and uh, uh, God, just give it your authority, not mine, to write it into our ears and hearts uh, and build your kingdom. For every person in this auditorium and listening through podcasts uh, or other means, I, God, I just pray that you would radically open up our lives and humble us to be submitted to your word and do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Okay, this uh, passage here is a minefield of controversy. Uh, it's just got a lot of interesting and strange stuff about it. And I can't possibly, in the 34 minutes that are left me here, I uh, can't possibly address uh, all of those issues. Uh, I'll just say this, it, that, that there's even a lack of consensus among scholars that this passage refers to the end of time. There are some scholars who argue, more persuasive than you, than you might think, that Jesus is actually referring to the, the war that the Romans launched against the Jews uh, between 66 and 70 A.D. Uh, there'd been a, a number of skirmishes between Romans and Israelites. The Romans got fed up with them, so they just squished them. And they destroyed the temple and cast them off the land. And the, the world, as the first century Palestinian Jews knew it, came to an end. And some scholars argue that that is what Jesus is referring to here. Uh, it, it, that strikes us as strange, but they argue if you understand the nature of, of, of apocalyptic literature and metaphors and hyperbole, that it makes sense. In fact, in Matthew's version of this teaching, he specifically associates it with the present generation, saying this will happen in your generation, and he associates it with the destruction of the temple. So it gives some plausibility to that. But there are other scholars who say, no, no, this has to relate to the end of time. And so it's an end times prophecy and then there's still others, and I fall into this camp, who, who really say, why can't it be both? Uh, often prophecies in the Bible have multiple applications. In fact, this is frankly how I read the book of Revelation. 
I think the primary reference of the book of Revelation are first century events. And you can find real clear correlations between the book of Revelation and things that were going on in the first century. But it also has application at different times in history and it also has an application at the end of history. So also I think that this passage can have elements which refer specifically to the first century but also has application to the end of time. Because after all, there are plenty of other verses in the New Testament that tell us to expect the Lord to return in a very obvious global manner. And some of them sound a lot like this passage. And so I think we're justified both in saying that it, it can, can have a first century application, but also has an application to a second coming that is yet future for us. And that's the one that we're most interested in. Now, as I said, there's a lot of issues and controversies here, but I want to focus on two things in the next 31 minutes now. Two things. I, I want to first draw out the main point of this passage. It's so easy when it comes to controversial issues to lose the force through the trees. We miss the main point because we're too caught up in details. I want to ask, what is the main point of this passage? And then I want to ad address one interpretation of one aspect of this passage, which I think has not been entirely helpful to people. So those are the two things we're going to do. First, the first thing I could entitle, be ready to let go, because that is, I think, the main point of this passage. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, uh, people will be eating, drinking, marrying, buying, selling, planting, and building, and so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. Now, those things aren't bad activities. Uh, Jesus isn't here saying, hey, here's the sign of the times. Uh, when I was first Christian in the early 70s, uh, we interpreted it like that. It was like, okay, here's the prophecy. Uh, and the end of the age, people are going to be marrying and giving in marriage and buying and selling and planting and building. Look around, man. People are getting married all over the place. They're buying and selling and planting and building. <laughs> Jesus is coming back any minute now. Well, Jesus might be coming back any minute now, but you can't point to that as proof of it. In fact, the point of the passage is the exact opposite. Jesus is saying, everything will be going on exactly as normal. It will be, there won't be anything different. It will be just the normal pattern of things. Marrying, giving a marriage, buying, selling, planning, building. And things will be totally normal. And then, bam, without notice, suddenly things are going to radically change. Uh, the thing is, is, we all get used to our normal. We think that, that the pattern of life, the rhythm of life now, it's easy for us to think that it will go on forever. It's, we're used to it. It's stable. And Jesus is saying... No, you know what? It feels like that, but then like a lightning bolt, when Jesus returns, everything's going to change. Don't get lulled into a false security by the pattern, the repetitive pattern of normal life. If history teaches us anything, and if, if Jesus teaches us anything, it's that things never go on the same. Your normal is never permanent. In the first century, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, the Jews, they believed that they were going to be on this land forever, and they believed they'd have the temple forever, and they could even point to some Old Testament verses uh, to, to, to solidify that. But then, almost overnight, the Romans get fed up with them, and they squish them like a bug and destroy the temple and cast them out of the land, and it didn't go on. Over, almost overnight, their life was radically changed. In the, in the 14th century, starting in 1349, Life was going on as normal. People were marrying, giving in marriage, buying, selling, planting, building. And then, boom, a plague hit called the bubonic plague. And they say that about 40% of all of Europe died in a span of three years. Two out of every five people. Imagine that. What if right now, you know, a plague hit, bird flu or something, and two out of every five people died? I mean, it would just be like a massive alteration of our life. Uh, you can't ever count on stable patterns to continue into the future. Uh, just um, a couple of years ago, 2004, people were going on with normal life, marrying, giving in marriage, buying, selling, planting, building, and then boom, in a split second, a quarter of a million people lost their lives, and far more than that, lost everything that they had. A tsunami hit Indonesia and a number of other countries, and uh, life was never the same for those, those people. Jesus is saying that when the Son of Man returns, it's going to be like that. Life will be going on as normal, normal patterns, normal rhythms, normal activity, and then bam, everything will change. And while it maybe is normal for people of the world to be lulled into the sleep of a false security by the routineness of their ordinary life, Jesus is telling us not to be. Don't be lulled into the false security that things will always be the same. Rather, we're to live and expect a radical, sudden change. Living every day as though it was our last, taking nothing for granted. 
And the way that we prepare ourselves, he's telling his disciples, the way you prepare yourself to to, uh, be prepared for that sudden change is by not clinging to anything. So that if you're on the housetop when the Son of Man returns, you don't think about going in trying to get your possessions. Or if you're on the field when the Son of Man returns, you don't think about running back to the house to get your possessions. Rather, you've lived in a way that you're prepared to, to drop everything and run when circumstances call for it. You don't go back. Remember Lot's wife. In fact, Lot's wife was a common illustration in the ancient world for people who cling too tightly to the world. She was leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, and she looked back to find the Lord. She was longing for that, trying to hang on to her home, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. Now, it's not clear what future circumstances this passage could have for us. When the Son of Man returns, how are we going to you know, be out in the field or on the housetop and not have to go back? What are we running from? It's not clear what that refers to. In fact, that's, that's one of the reasons why a number of scholars argue that this, this part at least has a first century application because it really does reflect what went on uh, with the Jews when the Romans attacked. They had to run for their lives. And if you went back into the house to try to grab anything, uh, you might have lost your life. Uh, but the point of the passage uh, still applies to us, and that is... That when the Son of Man returns, clinging to things will be disastrous. So live ready to let go of everything on a moment's notice. Don't cling. Now that teaching shouldn't surprise us because we've seen it a number of times before in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, Remember back in Luke 14, which is probably about a year ago now, um, he he, he taught us, uh, no one can be my disciple who has any possessions. You can't have any possessions if you're going to be my disciple. Now, he clearly didn't mean that you can't legally own anything because a lot of his disciples still had their houses and and things like that. They still legally own things. But what Jesus is saying there is don't ever try to possess anything. If you try to possess something, then know this. It possesses you. Don't ever cling to anything. Live life with open palms. Remember Lot's wife. Clinging to the world is disastrous. Live in a way where you're willing to drop everything on a moment's notice. It it, it all belongs to God, and so we can't cling to it. This is why when God tells us to give stuff away, we're not to question it. We're supposed to obey and give it away. And it's why when circumstances call for it, we should be able to drop everything and, and, and run. Whether it's the Son of Man returning in our lifetime, which could happen, or whether it's some other catastrophe which takes away everything in our lifetime, and that could already be happening, this economic crisis, or whether it's simply the fact that you're going to die. One way or another, you're going to lose everything, so live with that awareness. Remind yourself of the fact that everything you see in this epoch, in this age, uh, is going to vanish. It's just dust in the wind. I was at a store several weeks ago. It was one of these, and we're seeing all too many of these lately, but it was one of these clearance sales. And the the window said, everything's got to go. And I thought to myself, well, that's a pretty good slogan to live by. Everything's got to go. (laughs) You're not going to hang on to one thing. And maybe when the Son of Man returns, it may be some other catastrophe, or it may just be when you're going to die, but you're going to lose it all. The house, sorry, it's going to go. The car is going to go. Your stunning good looks are going to go. Your sex appeal, that's going to go faster than you can imagine. Uh, You know, (laughs) your, your nice portfolio, your nice bank account, everything, it's all going to go dust in the wind. So don't get lulled into the sleep of the ordinary thinking this lasts forever. Rather live with open palms being willing to drop everything on a moment's notice. This is not just just Jesus' teaching for end-time preparation. This is Jesus' teaching about life, and it's Jesus' prescription for freedom. Because the truth is this. When we cling to things that perish, it sucks life out of us. On some level, we know that we're eventually going to lose it. And that creates anxiety and fear and all sorts of other garbage in our life. Uh, We start turning into Lot's wife. We become rigid inflexible. We're becoming salt, and and it just sucks life out of us. Most of the anxiety and fear and worry and depression that people struggle with is the result of clinging to stuff that you know is going to leave you. It's like holding on to a corpse. It starts to infect you if you don't bury it before too long. So also, hanging on to stuff infects you. It sucks life out of you. On the other hand, to learn how to get all of your life from Jesus Christ, all of your worth from Jesus Christ, all of your love from Jesus Christ, your sense of being fully alive from Jesus Christ and from nothing else, to learn that secret and therefore to be able to let go of everything else, that is the key to fullness of living. That is the key to freedom. That is the key to life. You're never more fully free alive than when you don't need to be alive. 
when you don't need to cling to it. You can enjoy your house, but you don't need it. You can enjoy your athleticism, but you don't need it. You can enjoy all the stuff, but you don't need it. You don't cling to it. And now you are free. Now you are free. In fact, you'll enjoy life and be more fully alive. Certainly more kingdom and a lot more free if you don't need the stuff that you enjoy. You enjoy your house more when you're not perpetually worried about your house. And so your youthfulness and your good looks and your sex appeal and your portfolio and your bank account, you enjoy it when you're dancing with it with open palms, but you don't cling to any of it. And now your life begins to lose that fear and anxiety and worry. And now if you live like that, you're ready to, on a moment's notice, drop everything and not look back because it's not life to you. You don't cling to it. Everything in this present world will vanish. But, and here, here's my second point, that does not mean that God is giving up on this earth. And this leads to my second point here, uh, an interpretation I want to confront. It, it concerns this phrase, one was taken and one was left behind. Uh, a phrase I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Jesus says, on that night, two people will be in one bed, and one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken and the other left. Where are they taken, Lord? They asked, and he replied, where there is the dead body, there the vultures will gather. Okay, first a little incidental a historical point. Uh, he says, two people will be in one bed. And often, in fact, usually, in fact, I've never seen it otherwise taught, then that refers to a husband and wife. And so one will be taken and one will be left, and that's caused no little consternation uh, for some married folks. Um, that, the phrase does not necessarily uh, refer to a husband and wife. In fact, I'm quite sure it doesn't refer to a husband and wife. Uh, the phrase people there is in the Greek in the masculine, which uh, uh, I, I think refers to two men. Now, that doesn't mean that the two guys are gay. Here's the thing. Throughout most of history, single people and even sometimes married people it was assumed that they would share their bed with others who needed a place to sleep. Uh, it's very different than it is now. Only very rich people had their own beds. And only very, 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 very rich people had their own bedrooms. Uh, it wasn't that way throughout most of history, certainly not in the ancient world. One sign of hospitality was that uh, if, if someone was traveling and needed a place to sleep, you'd offer your bed to them. But you'd also sleep in it. They slept together, and their beds were like the size of our twin beds, even a little smaller. And they, it wasn't odd for two or three people uh, to sleep in that same bed. If you go to Fort Snelling right now, take their tour. It's really interesting. Go to the barracks. They've got these little twin beds. They're not really beds. They're just boards. And two or three soldiers would sleep on each one, in each one of those beds. That was considered normal. And on top of that, if there were strangers, uh, you know, travelers and, and merchants who were going by and needed a place to sleep, it was assumed that you'd invite them to sleep with you right there in that little bed. And now you got four guys. It's unbelievable. Stacked on top of one another. And now consider that this is before they, I mean, back in those days, they didn't take showers very often at all, and they hadn't invented toilet paper yet. It would really be unpleasant. <laughs> Aren't you glad you live in the 21st century? Hallelujah. <laughs> the fact that the next verse refers to two women out in the field, I think, really shows that we're referring to two people. There's a parallel here, two men. Two men will be in bed sleeping, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be out in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Now, what's up with this one taken, one left business? Many today, maybe even most who are hearing this message, assume that the one taken is taken in what's called the rapture. And the rapture refers to this uh, very prevalent Christian teaching that uh, when Jesus returns, um, he's actually going to come in stages. And in the first stage, he's going to uh, rapture all the Christians out of this world, literally suck them up into the sky and take them out of the earth. And then whoever's left behind... Uh, a.k.a. the Left Behind series. Whoever's left behind will go through all of the unpleasantries of the book of Revelation, now interpreted exclusively as a snapshot of how the world history will come to an end. Now, whatever you think about the rapture thing, and I'll get to that here in a second, I think that's a very unlikely interpretation of this verse. Okay, so just try to, to hear it like, like you've never heard this verse before. Uh, the one taken here, most scholars, but not all, there's no consensus on anything in here, but most scholars argue that the one taken in Luke and in Matthew is the unfortunate one, not a fortunate one. The one left behind is the lucky one. The picture here is of an invading army. And when the army invades, just as happened between 66 and 70 AD, uh, it's happenstance. One gets taken, one is, is, is left behind. One's captured and killed, the other one is, is, is uh, 
uh, fortunately, spirit are able to run out. The fate of the one taken is the same as the fate of the person who tries to run back and get their belongings. There's no time for that. Or the one who's on the housetop who tries to go down and get their possessions. There's no time for that. Their lives are taken from them. The one taken is, is, has the same fate as those who were taken in the flood. And the same as fate as those whose lives were taken when, when sulfur and, and fire came down from heaven. The, this interpretation seems confirmed, in my mind anyways, uh, by the answer to the disciples' questions, where? Where are they taken, Lord? And Jesus doesn't say, oh, well, they're the lucky ones who went up to heaven. He very cryptically and ominously says, well, where there's a dead body, there'll be vultures. And I think what he's saying there is that you'll know. Uh, it will be obvious. But notice, it's not a pleasant thing. Uh, it is a, a bad thing. Now, th- th- this, this may be new to many, because this passage has, for the last several hundred years, been associated with this thing called the rapture. I want to give a little, just for teaching purposes, a little background here, and you'll see in a moment where I'm going with this. Um, this teaching that Christians will be sort of suctioned up into the sky when Jesus returns, and that there will be two stages to the second coming. So far as I've been able to tell, and I've done quite a bit of research on this, it originated in the 19th century. Uh, so far as I can tell, it originated in Scotland in the early 19th century, uh, so far as I can tell, from a farm girl, a peasant girl who got a vision that she believed was telling her the right interpretation of certain passages. And she, for the first time in history, no one had ever done this before, so far as I know, associated the one taken with another passage of Scripture found in Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. And here Paul says, We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them, the others who were resurrected Uh, already, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And this young lady uh, took this phrase, caught up, uh, which is what's uh, signified by the term rapture, and um, she took it literally. And I think she was the first one in history to do that. And so the others who are left behind are the unlucky ones who now will have to go through the unpleasantries of the book of Revelation. This teaching caught on rather quickly in Europe and then made its way over to America. But throughout the 19th century, evangelicals, the mainstream evangelicals, regarded it as a strange, weird, bizarre, cultic belief. Uh, It was only in the 20th century, early 20th century, for a number of historical reasons, that it began to be kind of a mainstream teaching among evangelicals. It is that one verse, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then used to reinterpret the two passages in in Matthew and Luke that we're discussing this morning. That is what's behind the whole Left Behind series that I'm sure most of you have heard about. It's what's what's behind, it's what fuels and drives the whole Left Behind movies and and the songs that are sung about this. All those Larry Norman songs, Life Was Filled With Guns and War and Everyone Got Trampled on the Floor. It, it, It fuels all of that. Now, is that interpretation of 1 Thessalonians 4 and then the reinterpretation of Matthew and Luke, is that right? And the answer is maybe. Uh, maybe uh, it could be. But maybe not. And here's the thing. Here's the more important thing. Whatever you make of that, I would really encourage you not to put too much stake in that. Don't leverage too much on that because it's never wise to base a doctrine on one verse. Have your opinions based on one verse, fine. But to make a doctrine, a teaching on one verse is, 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 is never sound policy. It's especially never sound policy when, when the teaching is based on your interpretation of that one verse and when many scholars disagree with that interpretation of that one verse and when that interpretation of that one verse is very recent in church history. Up until the 19th century, no one had ever thought of that before. Now, it still might be right, but I'm just saying I wouldn't leverage a whole lot on that. Maybe true, maybe false. We can have differences of opinions, but I wouldn't base the doctrine on that. Many scholars argue that Paul wouldn't have meant that literally. Here's how they interpret the verse. Just try this on. Uh, with regard to the clouds, the Lord returning in the clouds, uh, you'll find throughout the Old Testament, in fact, we sang about it in one of the songs this morning, clouds, they always talk about God riding in the clouds, but they didn't mean it literally. They meant it in terms of signifying his majesty, his dominion, his authority. Uh, the idea of meeting the Lord in the air. It's well known among scholars that air was, signified the domain of authority over the earth. It was, just this, it, it, it was a metaphor for the authority over this earth. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 2 that uh, Satan is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. 
It's, it's a kingdom of authority over this earth, which is why he is now the spirit who's at work in those who are being disobedient. So the kingdom of the air is the kingdom of authority over the, all, the, uh, all the earth. And finally, the idea of going out or going up to meet your king. Many scholars argue that that refers to the ancient practice when a king was returning back to a city after having been on a, 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 a journey, or especially if he was out in some kind of warfare, as a return to the city, the people of the city would go out and meet the, their lord, their king. And then they'd welcome the king back into the city, and if he had just won a war, uh, he would share the booty with them, and they'd have a massive celebration. So if you put that all together, what you get is something like this. Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verse 17, that when the Lord returns, we will usher our king in celebration back to this earth. And he will be now at that time, no longer Satan will be the Lord of the air. He will be the Lord of the air. Uh, he will be the one riding in the clouds. He will come with majesty and authority and power. We shall gr greet him and welcome him back to earth. And there we will be with him forever. But notice, where we'll be with him is not some other planet, but it's here on the earth. And whatever you think about the details of end times and the rapture is not really of that much concern to me. What is important to me, however, is I think it's important that we, we understand that where this thing ends up in the end is on the earth. I, I taught a class at Bethel one time on eschatology, which is just the study of end times. And one of the assignments I gave to my students was to look up every verse in the Bible that could plausibly be interpreted as referring to end times. And they found over 3,000. And what we found was, I asked them the question, where is the final state where is it, where, 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 where is it you know, going to be conducted? And in every verse except for two, it's explicit that it was on the earth. God loves this earth and is going to reign on this earth. And the two verses that didn't seem to re be uh, referring to the earth could easily be interpreted in ways that were consistent with that. In the book of Revelation, the, the final vision is given that, that God has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And that's what you find over and over and over and over again. We'll reign with him on the earth. The reason why I think that's important is because it can affect how we live. It does affect how we live. Ask yourself this question. Who, generally speaking, takes better care of property? Owners or renters? Those of you who are landlords will answer that enthusiastically. It's the owners. Renters tend not to take as good care of their property. My worry about any theology that says we escape this world and we never come back, we get out of this world and now the world just kind of gets incinerated and, and, and gets destroyed, so the final state is on some other planet or some other dimension or some other whatever, that that can really encourage a renter's mindset with regard to this earth rather than having an owner's mindset. It's like if you're renting an apartment that is going to be destroyed at any minute, you're not likely to take really good care of that apartment. Uh, you're likely to just treat it like trash, because what difference does it make? Well, in my early uh, walk with God, when I became a Christian in the 70s, I was taught this rapture theology in a way that really uh, made us treat the earth like it was just a... Uh, temporary thing, and we could treat it however we want. We had a very individualistic and escapist theology, an exit theology. The final goal is to abandon this place. We're getting out of this joint, and this joint's going to hell in a handbasket, and I mean that literally. And uh, it's very individualistic. I'm getting out of here, uh, and I'll grab the hand of somebody on the way up, but, but the, the goal is to get out. Uh, we didn't care about the environment. In fact, to care about the environment, that liberals did that. Those liberals, because they have no other hope. But we know that's all going to get incinerated, so what difference does it make? And, and we didn't care about social justice, things like poverty or AIDS or oppression or anything like that. The liberals care about social justice. Uh, why would we be worried about that? That's like rearranging furniture on the Titanic. You know, that's like, like, like giving a new paint coating to your, your room that's going to be burned up in a second that you're renting. It, it just doesn't make any sense. It was very self-centered. It was very escapist. We're just passing through. We're temporary renters. We're going to leave this sorry joint. Goodbye and good riddance. And our songs used to reflect that. Oh, don't you weep for me when I'm gone? No, because I won't have to leave here alone. But when I hear that last trumpet sound, my feet won't stay on the ground. I'm going to rise with a shout. I'm going to fly. I'm going to meet with the Lord in the sky. Heaven is near, so I can't stay here. Goodbye, world, goodbye. <laughs> yeah, it was like, man, we used to get off on that. I mean, that was a celebration song for us. 
And here we're leaving all the rest of the world to be devoured by the Antichrist or whatever. You know, it's, it's uh, what were we, were we thinking? Here's the, here, here, see, that, that mindset, I think, is still quite widespread. That's why, to this day, uh, there are folks who accuse you of being liberal if you care about the earth, if you start talking about the environment, or you start talking about the right treatment of animals or anything like that. They think that you're liberal. But I submit to you that that's not being liberal, that's just being biblical. <laughs> Amen. Now, listen to this. God, God, go back to Genesis 1, the charter for this whole creation. Okay, this, is our, this, is, this is the charter. Human beings, you're here to have dominion over the earth and over the animals. And our job is to be in his image as we do that, to reflect his character by the way we treat one another, the way we treat animals, and the way we treat the earth. That was a God's original plan. And I submit to you, he's never given up on that plan. There are some particulars that he changes his mind about throughout the, the biblical narrative, but he never changes his mind about this. This is the whole creation project. God doesn't give up on his real estate. He doesn't surrender that real estate. He fights for it. That's what the whole biblical narrative is about. The whole biblical narrative I submit to you is about how God wants to use us to get his real estate back and to reinstate us as its rightful co-owners, its landlords, whether his viceroys, his administrators, to carry out his will on earth as it is in heaven. The whole biblical narrative is about how we're not just renters, but rather we're the rightful co-owners of this real estate, so we're supposed to take responsibility for it and to submit our lives to him in how we take responsibility for it. The whole message of the Bible I submit to you, is not holding out the hope that we're going to leave earth and go to heaven. Rather, it's about how we're supposed to live in a way that brings heaven down to earth. God doesn't give up on his real estate. We're to be bringing heaven down here. And there is an interim stage, or there might be an interim stage where we leave this world, and we sing about that a little earlier, and, and, and there's an, you know, we're, we're with the Lord. But the final, after the resurrection, uh, that is when... Just read Revelation 21. The new Jerusalem comes down to the earth. The earth is the place where heaven is set up. We're to live and pray in a way that fulfills the Lord's prayer when he says, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God cares about the earth. He wants his will to be done on the earth. And someday this dream will be fulfilled. The Son of Man will return and he'll bring a sudden end to the old order of, 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 way, of, old order of a way of doing things. But that will also be the sudden beginning of a new way of doing things. And there's many details. Most of the details are hidden from us. But we do know this, that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. The Bible says there will be a new earth. It'll be a perfected version of this one. But notice, it is the earth. Just like our resurrected bodies are going to be perfected versions of these bodies. Thank God for that. But they will still be our bodies. Here's the thing. God loves your body. He created it. He's not going to leave it to disintegrate. He's going to resurrect it in a new, improved, eternal form. So also, God loves the earth. And, and when he sets up the new earth, it's going to be different than this earth, the same way our resurrected bodies are, will be different from these bodies. That earth will have no more death or decay or destruction or, or any of the things that are the result of the curse and the demonic oppression in, in nature and things of that sort. But it will be the earth. God loves the earth. If you don't think that God loves the earth, maybe you need to hear this. This is one of the things he's going to do when he returns and does away with the old order of things. It says that there'll come a time when he'll judge the dead. Dan, what does this verse say? And he will, he, uh, he'll be judged those, uh, for de he'll destroy those who destroy the earth. There'll come a time for destroying those who destroy the earth. You think God cares about the earth? He sure does. He's ticked, at, ticked off at the people who abuse it and who destroy it. And here's the really, really important point. Our job, as we say over and over and over again here, because it's just so central to Scripture, our job is to manifest the kingdom now. We're to be a manifestation of the kingdom that is coming, and we manifest it in an age that doesn't yet acknowledge the coming kingdom. We're to be, as the Bible says, first fruits, which means we're, 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 we're fruit that's picked ahead of time. We've ripened early, and we are a sign of what's coming. We're to live in a way that we're a window into the future as much as possible, so people can see something about what creation will look like when they look at us in our community, which means we're to live now in ways that reflect the way the world will be in the future. We're to live now as the co-owners of the world, the co-rulers of the world that God created us and saved us to be. God loves his real estate 
so we're called to love his real estate. God loves his animal kingdom, so we're called to reflect that love to the animal kingdom. God loves justice in all of our human relationships, so we are to love justice and seek justice in all of our human relationships. It means that caring about the way we treat the environment and the impact we have on the animal kingdom is not some liberal PETA cause. They may have their own reasons for doing it, but we do it for kingdom reasons. That is a kingdom mindset. That is a kingdom cause. That is a kingdom agenda. We kingdom people have to ask ourselves, since we are the ones commissioned to partner with God on co-owning this real estate of his, and we're called to manifest the coming future kingdom, we are the ones who have to ask, how do we use energy? How do we use water? Do we waste unnecessarily? Are we having an unnecessarily negative impact on the environment? That's not liberal. That's being biblical. We have to ask the question, how does our eating ha do our eating habits and our lifestyle impact the animal kingdom? Are we taking responsibility for what we are inflicting on animals by our choices in terms of eating? Uh, on my website, it's just gregboy.org, um, I have a documentary up there. Um, that it's called Eating Mercifully. It was, it, it, part of it was done here at Woodland Hills Church. And I encourage all of you to go and look at that documentary. It's 27 minutes long. And it's just helping us raise our awareness about how our choices on food impact animals. And we've got to ask the question, is that good stewardship? Are we reflecting God's character by the way we're treating animals, not just directly, but the way we cause them to exist indirectly by the choices we make on what we eat? We have to live in that question. And I'm not getting, there's no room for legalism here, that one size fits all. We're all in process on this. But all I'm saying is kingdom people, as those who are called to manifest the coming creation, we have got to live in this question. Are our relationships manifesting God's justice? Are our, is our treatment of animals manifesting God's loving dominion? Is the way that we treat and impact the earth reflecting uh, the obedience to God's charter? The first command he ever gave us is to take care of the animals and take care of the earth. However God decides all the details on wrapping this up at the end of history, I don't really care. What I do know is that we're called to live this now. Manifest this now. Reflect God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. All right. Uh, here's the thing. That's the teaching. If, if this is just kind of interesting curiosity stuff, then we just wasted our time. It's got to impact our life. And so I encourage you to stop by at the hub and get those assignment sheets and just start talking with your spouse, your kids, your friends, your small group uh, uh, about these kinds of issues. Just start the journey. You know, you don't, have to, don't, don't, don't try to rush to answers. Just start the journey. Uh, start doing some research. Start growing in this. But the goal is simply to manifest the domain of God's reign in everything we do. Not just on Sunday morning, not just in a prayer time, but rather, you know, it will affect how long we take our showers. It will affect what's on the, on the table. It might affect where you go shopping. It might affect what kind of coffee you buy or what kind of chocolate you buy. As you learn and grow in this, the kingdom affects everything. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Will the prayer team come up? And if you're here and have any need whatsoever that you'd like to have prayed for, I encourage you to come up here and pray with these folks. If you want to give your life to Jesus, come up here and talk to these folks. They'd love to introduce you to the kingdom. Lord, as we leave this place, God, let your spirit bug us to remember all the stuff and to be seeking to live countercultural lives that reflect your beauty uh, to each other, to the animals, and to the earth. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Go out and love an animal. <laughs>